All right, so we will discuss the modern definition of the mediastinal compartments and the approach to the mediastinal mass. Uh, we're going to concentrate more on the radiological approach than the clinical because we're all radiologists, but before we go on, up until now the division of the mediastinum was by a, a plain chest radiograph and it wasn't always anatomical and the language that we spoke and the surgeon spoke was not the same language. So uh, a few years ago there was an international uh, discussion about this and we gathered data, etc., and we voted and it was decided that for CT to improve our differential diagnosis and diagnostic capabilities, we decided to create a division that would work with cross-sectional imaging. So right now the prevascular mediastinum, which is the anterior mediastinum, is anything anterior to the pericardium. And remember that the pericardium wraps around the heart, so it's not just anterior, it's an outside of the heart. And that's what's considered the anterior mediastinum or the prevascular. The, the division between the posterior and the visceral or the middle uh, mediastinum is basically a line. It's an imaginary line that we draw one centimeter posterior to the anterior portion of the vertebral body. The reason is, is for us as radiologists to nail down the diagnosis because almost all the tumors that happen in the paravertebral regions, and that's the paravertebral uh, mediastinum back here where the yellow is, they're almost always neural tumors. And then the middle we'll talk about. So let's talk about regular signs because we as radiologists have to start with the diagnosis from the plain film. So I'm going back to first year of residency. So when we have a chest radiograph and the mass goes above the clavicle, we know it's not in the anterior mediastinum, so now we're thinking, oh, is it the middle, is it the posterior? Well, we look at the border between the lung and this mass, and you can see that it's very sharp, meaning lung abuts it directly. So it cannot be in the middle because the middle goes up into the neck and it will be more blurry. So this has to be in the posterior mediastinum, as we said, paravertebral mediastinum, neural tumor, this was a ganglioneuroma. You can see, look at the neural foramina, they're enlarged. And you can see it here, of course, in the MRI, how this low tumor enlarges the neural foramina. Now, the middle mediastinum is a bunch of uh, malignancies, usually metastatic disease and lymphoma. And then we have esophageal benign and bronchogenic benign things and malignant. So malignant esophageal cancer, the benign bronchogenic cyst, duplication cyst. But the main thing is to remember when we look at each chest radiograph, remember these lines. We have the anterior junction line, which is the anterior prevascular mediastinum, where the lungs meet each other. And then we have the azigoesophageal interface. We call it a line when there's air in the esophagus. You can see it's a line because there's air in the esophagus. This is where the lung meets the azigous and the esophagus. That's why we have this structure. So here it is here. This is an esophagus with air, and this is the lung touching the azigoesophageal line. And it's important to look for it on every single film. So if we look at this film over here and we see the azigoesophageal line, we say, wow, what is this thing here? And then I see the air fluid level and I go, wow, it's just a hiatal hernia. Look again, because it doesn't go up. Maybe here there's a hiatal hernia, but here there's no air, there's fullness. This was the esophageal cancer and lymphadenopathy. If we don't look for this interface, we will not find it. With benign disease, same thing. It will displace the azigoesophageal line. This is a bronchogenic cyst. Does not enhance when you give contrast. When you measure it, it can be fluid, but it's usually proteinaceous, easier with MRI. But I'd like to concentrate on the prevascular mediastinum anterior to the pericardium because that's where our impact as radiologists is probably the strongest. So first of all, don't forget the, uh, the silhouette sign. You can see that the heart here, there's a bulge and we don't really see the heart border because the mass touches the heart and causes the silhouette sign. And again, pay attention to the anterior junction line which we can see in 20% of the patients because if we don't pay attention to it, we're gonna miss this bulge over here in the anterior mediastinum which was due to a thymoma. Look on the posterior here. We don't always get the, the, the we don't always get the lateral film. So when a typical resident gets to see the anterior mediastinal mass and goes, oh, that's easy, it's in three T's, thyroid goiter, thymoma, terrible lymphoma, teratoma. That's not a good enough uh, differential. And it's also not good to remember 20 different differentials and just give them away. We want to be helpful. For that, we need to know our radiology, to know the pathognomonic ones that we should recognize, the no-touch lesions. We, the clinical approach, we're often lacking a lot of information. 
but there is so little information that we need to nail down the diagnosis or to limit it tremendously so that we can be helpful to our clinicians. And the other question that are, we're often asked is what's the next step? What imaging modality we should use? And the answer is not just a, a knee jerk. We have to take into consideration many things. So first of all, many of these need contrast injection. Not all patients can get that, so we would want an MRI. Now studies have shown that we do better with CT in general uh, and compared to MRI with nailing down the diagnosis, but we don't do well with CT with the cystic lesions. So in specific indications, MRI is much better than CT. So if we take, for example, a young patient, and now there's concern about radiation, and let's say the patient has myasthenia gravis, what on earth are we looking for? We're not looking for a lung cancer. All we want to know is, is there a thymoma, because this patient will go to surgery. So we don't need to do a CT. That's a disease that you, you don't need the lungs as much. You want the mediastinum and the pleura. You see it very well with MRI. Or the patient with MEN1 syndrome, they can get a carcinoid in the anterior mediastinum. So they get an annual, annual cross-sectional imaging. They're young. Why do we need to do a CT? All they need is an MRI to the anterior mediastinum. So you should ask yourself when you see these patients coming along, maybe next time I should recommend getting an MRI and not a CT. So we're going to divide our differentials of the anterior mediastinum into three groups. One are the very common masses that are pathognomonic on imaging, where we can shine. The other group is the rare diseases, but again, that we can shine, pathognomonic. And then the third group is masses that we see, but we need a little bit, just a little bit of clinical information, and we'll see what it is. So let's look at the first group, where we know for sure what the diagnosis is. It's goiter, benign teratoma, thymic cyst, and pericardial cyst. So again, we look at the chest radiograph, we see, yes, there is a mass uh, up, up here. It goes above the clavicle, so right away I know this is not just anterior mediastinum. Now I have to decide, is it posterior, is it middle? I look over here and I see, well, it does go above, but there's kind of a blurry border between it and the lung. So maybe it's contiguous with the neck and not with, with the posterior mediastinum because it's not sharp there. And this is typical for goiter. We see that very often. And when you see that, look quickly at the trachea because goiters typically will displace the trachea to one side. And on CT, it has a very typical appearance. Without contrast, it's muscle or higher in attenuation. You give contrast and it's highly, up, there's high uptake of contrast and it will continue often to the neck. And you'll see that the same imaging characteristics are seen in the neck portion and the chest portion with cystic change, calcifications, and sometimes we don't even see the connection. But it doesn't matter because sometimes it's just a fibrous strand and we can't see it with imaging. It doesn't matter because you see a typical characteristic appearance of a goiter with high contrast, cystic change, calcifications, same in the neck, same in the chest, it's a goiter, and there's no need to do anything. Uh, the, if you're thinking about cancer, which is rare with goiters, things to, to, to look for are lymphadenopathy, obliteration of borders, and infiltration of the surrounding structures, but typically goiter is just very sharply demarcated. The next one where we can shine in is the benign or mature teratoma. This is a tumor that's composed of, foreign, of tissue foreign to the site, typically present are two, two or more layers of embryonic layers and they're usually asymptomatic, young adults, men and women. What we're looking for is fat, fraying fat, negative 40 to negative 120. We're looking for teeth and bone. We can see some fluid. Um, and the, the, the thing that's pathognomonic is if we see a fluid, fluid level, as here, fat and fluid, or bone and tooth formation. This is MRI that shows very nicely the fluid, fluid level, typical for a teratoma. There's no need to do anything. Usually they're taken out, though. Now, thymic cysts, when you look at what's written here, less than 5%, you know I took this article from a surgical series. And this is because thymic cysts or pericardial cysts are normally not surgical diseases. They, they're taken out when someone's not sure of themselves. But we recently conducted a multi-institutional international questionnaire study of different uh, radiology departments around the world in three different continents. And what we found out was that thymic cysts are actually seen in a third of the patients that present with a mediastinal mass, or a fourth of the patients that present with a mediastinal mass, because when we recognize them, they're not taken out. It's only if they cause trouble if someone's not sure of themselves. People can be born with them. They can be a result of inflammation or of treatment to the area. It's our job to recognize them as a simple cyst. And 
I don't care now if you're questioning, did this arise from the thymus? Did this arise, what you're seeing here, from, from the pericardium? Because both live in this area. It doesn't matter. It's the same features. We're looking for a well-circumscribed mass with imperceptible walls. It can be round, oval, or saccular. And it may measure water. But in fact, the majority of them actually do measure more than 20 Hounsfield units. I've even seen one with 97 Hounsfield units. And that is because there's proteinaceous material in them. <coughs> so you may ask me, how do I differentiate the proteinaceous thymic cyst from a thymoma? And the answer is simple, with MRI. Because with MRI, it's a very simple MRI. All you need is a T2-weighted image, a T1 with and without contrast. You're looking for on the T2 weighted image, which is, gives you the most for your money. You want to make sure that there's absolutely no nodularity, no thickened septum in there. And on the contrast enhanced study, you want to make sure that there's absolutely no nodularity or septal thickening that's enhancing. When you see a thing like this, you know this is a simple cyst, and there's no need to do anything about it. So here's another one. <coughs> this is a cystic lesion. Is this a simple cyst? I think you'd agree with me that it's difficult to see here that there's something that's a little higher in attenuation. This is with contrast. And despite that, it was very difficult to make the diagnosis only with a CT that this was actually a cystic thymoma. And that's the take home message. When you're making the diagnosis of a simple cyst, make sure there's absolutely no nodularity in there because a cystic thymoma will look the same except it'll have nodularity or a thickening of, of the wall. So MRI is much better than CT in making this diagnosis. And if we had MRI on each of these cases, we would, we would uh, limit the, the unnecessary surgery that is done. From the unnecessary thymectomies that are done, a third of them are due to thymic cysts and the other third of thymic hyperplasia. So pericardial cysts, same thing. We're looking for the same things. Imperceptible wall, no nodularity. This is a very typical location for it, the cardiophrenic angle, typically on the right. And the thing is, you don't want to recommend a follow-up because these cysts grow and get small, grow and get small. So this was taken three days apart. One time it's 3.6 centimeters, the other time it's 2.7 centimeters. You can imagine what would have happened if we'd seen it grow. There would be hysteria. There's no need to, to be uptight about that. That's natural. And the other thing is sometimes there can be some inflammation within it. So on PET-CT, when we look at cystic lesions, we'd expect to be a, see a cold spot. And here you see there's some uptake. That's because a little bit of inflammation can happen. So FDG PET-CT is not the way to go either. It's MRI. Now, our second group of, of diagnoses that we should shine in are the ones that are rare, but we like to see because we can look smart. So one of them is thymoma that already has a pleural metastasis because that mode of spread is very typical. And the other one are the three tumors that are rare, but all contain fat, thymolipoma, lipoma, and liposarcoma. So thymolipomas are very rare, and they're very large when they're encountered because they're asymptomatic. More than uh, up to 85% of them will have frank fat. If there's soft tissue, it's sometimes organized like this in a wave-like pattern. It can have less as in this case over here. Rarely is associated with myasthenia gravis or Graves' disease, but it's the presence of fat, the lack of symptoms, the relatively young age, which would raise this diagnosis. And the other question is lipoma. Lipomas are usually well encapsulated. The capsule very thin, contain almost only fat. But the thing is that it's so rare <coughs> that I don't think you're going to ever see it. And in fact, why is this question mark over here? Although initially I thought this was a lipoma. Look at the reconstructed images. This is the omentum actually going up from the belly into the chest. It's a Morgani hernia. Those are much more common than seeing a lipoma in the anterior mediastinum. But I think it's the benign features that you see that should calm you down when you see this and you can shine as a radiologist. And this is what we fear, the liposarcoma. So liposarcomas behave differently. First of all, they're extremely rare. Second thing is that 85% of the patients are symptomatic and they displace organs and they grow. We always fear the well differentiated liposarcoma where there will be very little soft tissue and we don't want to miss that. And I think that because of this, even though when we see benign disease because of the size, they usually tend to go to surgery. But it's important for us to recognize the appearance of the teratomas, of the thymolipomas, and all of those, because if a patient is old, because if a patient is not a surgical candidate, at least if we recognize benign disease, they don't need to go to surgery, and people can be calm not doing anything about them. 
Now this is pathetic mnemonic. When you see an anterior mediastinal nodular mass and with it a pleural nodularity, it will almost always be a thymoma because they tend to spread along the pleura. There are very little masses in the mediastinum that will do that. So this is just a thymoma with pleural metastatic disease, still a surgical candidate. Let's move to the tough group of, of uh, cases of patients where when you look at the mass, you cannot nail down the diagnosis, but we're gonna use some common sense and the very little data that we have from the image itself. We're dealing with thymoma that hasn't spread to the pleura. Thymocarcinoma and carcinoids all fall into that same group of thymic epithelial can, uh, uh, malignancies together with thymoma. They're just more aggressive than thymoma. We're going to talk about thymic hyperplasia, how we never want to miss a case and we don't want to misdiagnose it. We don't want patients to go unnecessary for resection of this benign condition. Lymphomas, which is a non-surgical disease, and the non seminomas germ cell tumor and seminoma. So let's first talk about thymic hyperplasia because I see confusion about this and reports that are studies that are sent to me. So first of all, this in the, the, the thymus itself grows until puberty and then decreases in size. And it doesn't decrease in all of us at the same rate. We can sometimes see 40 year olds with some rest of the thymus, but it has a very typical appearance to it. And also after severe diseases, such as after burns, after a long period with chemotherapy, um, or, um, or patient, we can get thymic hyperplasia. A different type of thymic hyperplasia we can get in patients with myasthenia gravis or HIV. What's typical about it, first of all, is the story. So this is a patient, a teenager, who on this study over here on the left ha was undergoing chemotherapy for osteosarcoma. And you can see the thymus involuted, maintained its, its triangular shape. And then on the follow-up, after the patient recovered a few months later, after he's not getting treatment, you can see wham the thymus grew tremendously. The, the typical finding here is that it maintained its bilobed shape and that you see these vessels over here. When you go up and down, the vessels just cross it normally. This is a normal thymus only that there's hyperplasia. If you're not 100% sure of yourself, ask what the story is. Here you have follow-ups. You know it's, a, it's an oncologic patient. You know this is a typical thymic hyperplasia. The other thing is the patient that comes with no prior study. You look at it, and this here, this mass-like lesion here, it looks exactly like steak that's been cut uh, shortwise on, on, on the fibers. These are little dots with lots of fat embedded within them. This is the typical appearance of the thymic hyperplasia or normal thymus. You don't want to touch it. There's nothing to do about this. But if you're not sure of yourself, such as in this patient who was a 38-year-old who came with chest pain, we never figured out why. But she had more of a bulky appearance to her thymus, and the question was raised whether this was a thymoma or something else. So the exam that helps us out is MRI. So unlike the cyst where we want a T2 and a T1 with and without contrast, with thymic hyperplasia, very simple, one sequence. All we need to see is a phase in, phase out. Okay, it's chemical shift imaging, just like we do with the adenomas of the adrenal glands, because what we're looking for is the signal dropout. So this is the phase in, you see the mass over here, and you can see how there's significant drop of signal, and this is thymic hyperplasia, and nothing needs to be done anymore. Now that's unlike the thymomas. So thymo thymomas can come in any size. They can be very small, like one centimeter, two centimeters, and they can be even 20 centimeters large. The majority will be around five centimeters, seven centimeters that we usually see in clinical practice. Some can be homogenous like this one. They can have calcifications within them like this one. And uh, when you see a mass in the anterior mediastinum like this, you will be right, I'd say 99% of the time when you say this is a thymoma because it is the most common primary mass in the anterior mediastinum. Now some of them, and that's if you know this then you're going to nail down the diagnosis, some of them will have some symptoms related to it like myasthenia gravis, uh, pure red blood cell uh, aplasia. When you have that information plus the mass you know it's a thymoma. What is pathognomonic, as we said before, is if we see the spread of the tumor along the pleura, because that's typical for spread, but hopefully you'll see the disease when it's earlier on. What's typically absent with thymoma, even when it's spread, is lymphadenopathy. When you see lymphadenopathy, you have to either think about the more aggressive form, thymic cancer, or of a different diagnosis. Now, the thing about thymoma is that you need contrast to image. So if the patient cannot get contrast, don't get a non-contrast enhanced CT, get an MRI 
or if the patient is young, like the myasthenia gravis coming, just get an MRI directly because it gives you all the information you need for staging. Thymomas not only like to go to the pleura, which is easily seen with MRI, but they also like to invade locally. And they like to invade locally the veins. And you can see here the mass and very clearly seen the invasion into the SVC or here on the coronal view into the SVC, both of these images without contrast. When you have a more aggressive appearance, as you have here, this is the thymic cancer. Again, same group, similar therapies, just worse prognosis. You can see here invasion of the myocardium, direct spread. And when you see such great invasion in the area, think that maybe it's the same group, but maybe more towards the thymic carcinoma. And MRI will also stage the distant disease because these diseases tend to go to the pleura, as you can see here. This is the thymic carcinoma or to the bone, just like lung cancer. And you can see that very easily on MRI as well. Now, the way not to go is an FDG PET-CT. Because unlike lung cancer, when you're dealing with the anterior mediastinal mass and the differentials that you have there, FDG PET-CT will not be that useful. Because many of the thymomas do not show any FDG activity. This here is an image of a thymoma who was locally advanced, had absolutely no FDG activity in it. On the other hand, another thymoma did. So that doesn't tell much. I will tell you that the aggressive forms, thymic carcinoma, do have a lot of FDG activity in them. But the problem is that thymic hyperplasia, the benign condition which we should make the diagnosis on, can have FDG activity, described even up to 7.3. So just the lack of FDG activity or the presence of FDG activity will not always differentiate benign from malignant disease when dealing with an anterior mediastinal mass. What do we need to know when we look at a patient who we think he has thymoma? I'm not going to go through all the staging, which changed together with the lung cancer staging and the new AJCC manual, but you need to know the things you need to look for on imaging. So these patients are treated surgically if they can be resected. But if it's locally advanced or if it's spread only to the pleura, they need to get neoadjuvant therapy, chemotherapy, prior to resection. So we have to look carefully and state every place that's suspicious. So the first place locally that it likes to go is to, the, so after it goes into the fat pericardium, that we cannot tell on imaging and it doesn't matter, it doesn't change the stage much. The major thing for changing the stage more significantly and where the patient needs to get chemotherapy is if the tumor invades stuff that we can resect, lung, uh, the veins like the SVC, the brachycephalic veins, or the phrenic nerve. So those are things where if the patient has that, we'll still go to resection, but after chemotherapy to enable complete resection. Things to look for, not only intraluminal tumor, as we saw, but also irregularity of the vessel. This is the thymoma, this is the left brachycephalic vein, and you can see the contour is irregular because it is involved. Next are the patients that do, do not go to surgery. We have to comment on this. We have to look for invasion to structures which will make the patient not operable, such as the aorta, the myocardium, as we saw in the other case I showed you, the main pulmonary artery, the trachea, the esophagus. And this is just an example. There was a tumor higher up, and you can see that the fat around the right coronary artery is, is uh, infiltrated. So this patient was a non-surgical candidate. So after we, talk, we talked about thymoma, I just want to let you sh to show you the statistics and seeing that above the age of 40, with a patient presenting with a mediastinal mass, you're almost always dealing with the green, both in men and women, which is thymoma, and the orange is goiter. And there's very little anything else, like the lymphomas and everything. They're, they're not that common. It's a bag of other things. So we're pretty much correct just by stating that we think something is a thymoma when it looks the way I showed you. But below the age of 40, we're dealing with different things. First of all, thymoma is extremely rare below the age of 30, not the way to go to state that. And here, the lymphomas become much more common. So the red and the, uh, the pink are all uh, lymphomas, okay, common in both men and women. The non seminomas germ cell tumors, you can see they get a higher percentage in the men. And thymoma gets much rarer, especially you know, in the very younger population. So what, when should we suspect a lymphoma? First of all, if you have something in the anterior mediastinum, but there are many lymph nodes elsewhere, that would be very atypical for, for a thymoma. Then you should strongly think about lymphoma, as you see in this case. If the tumor in the anterior mediastinum 
seems to invade the structures but doesn't really destroy them. So you look at this here, it's invading the chest wall, but the, the sternum kind of looks normal. That's more typical for lymphoma than it would be for a lung cancer, for a thymoma. Or it insinuates itself around greatly and around vessels yet doesn't really um, totally compress them. That would be more in favor of lymphoma than of the other diagnoses. Now, if we have any information on the requisition, such as the B symptoms, fever, weight loss, night sweats, of course we're going to think much, uh, we're going to think more highly of lymphoma as the possibility than anything else. Why is it important? It's important because when we are asked to biopsy it, knowing that this is a lymphoma, first of all, when we we conduct discussions with our clinicians. We want to say, hey, I don't think this is a surgical disease. We need to get some tissue. And when we get the tissue for them, we want to make sure we get many cores because for lymphoma, they're going to need that for, for the classification. The other thing that's not very helpful is the FDG uptake because these other malignancies in the antimediastinum, whether we're dealing with lymphoma, thymocarcinoma, paraganglioma, non synonyms, germ cell tumors, they all have a high FDG activity. It's not going to help us distinguish between all of them. But I think this article here, what they stated, how they use it, which is not really necessary, but what they use it for, in this group that practiced, they liked to take their thymomas straight to surgery. Some people don't do that. Some get a biopsy before. But if that's how you practice in your institution, maybe uh, FDG PET-CT will help you eliminate how many get a preoperative biopsy because if the FDG was, is relatively low, you can assume that you're not dealing with one of these more aggressive malignancies and maybe it's a thymoma, so maybe we'll take the, the patient to surgery first. But it's not, again, as I told you, not very helpful and not good in staging for thymoma that's not FDG avid. Now, seminoma, they're usually more homogenous. They're in men only, young men. They can often present with pulmonary metastases. And non seminomas germ cell tumors, can be men and women, but they're more aggressive looking, heterogeneous. They're often, they often have lung metastases as well. The one thing about non seminomas germ cell tumors is they're very high alpha fetoprotein and beta HCG. Now, we don't always have that information, but if we do, it's a non brainer. We don't even have to think. So, let's just quickly go over the clinical al algorithm here. If you have this information, it's nice. If not, I think we're doing a great job even without it. But rapid onset of symptoms, we think about lymphoma, non seminomous germ cell tumor. With lymphoma, we're looking for B symptoms. With non seminomous germ cell tumor, we're looking for the labs, alpha fetoprotein and beta HCG. With intermediate onset, again, lymphoma, just less aggressive, or seminoma. Again, with lymphoma, we want to ask about those B symptoms. And we want to make sure we get a biopsy before we go to surgery. And with thymoma, they're often asymptomatic or have a very prolonged course. So we discussed the difference, uh, uh, difference how we divide the mediastinum with CT, which is a little different than chest radiographs. And we described the approach and that we went over the pathognomonic entities which we should make. We should make those diagnoses. And I just have one question for you guys. This is an anterior mediastinal mass over here. This is a T2 weighted image. And I want you to vote just like this. Who's for benign cyst? No one. Who's for lymphoma? No one. Who's for thymoma? Okay. Who's for thymic hyperplasia? Very good job. This is a cystic thym uh, thy thymoma. Lots of fluid and the nodularity here in the septum. And I can see that you've been listening. Very good. Thank you.